Hi, my name is Heather Richmond. Welcome to the channel. Hope everyone is doing well and you guys are taking care of yourselves. So I want to talk a little bit about the human brain and its importance in both the literal sense as well as the metaphorical. Because we know that as we continue through this process of transfiguration leading to the the final fusion of, um, of the conscious mind and the subconscious mind to form the, the superconscious mind or to form your individual access to the superconscious. Um, as we go through that process, there are, um, different events that unfold in, of course, the entirety of the human body, but um, I want to look at the brain specifically. So this is an idea that you may have potentially <clears throat> heard referenced as the the 13th crystal skull. Um, so if we look at the 12 disciples and the story of the 12 disciples in in scripture. And I know I've mentioned this before, but I'll, I'll repeat it. Um, the, the Bible truly is this deeply encoded, um, text that is to serve as a, a handbook as we go through this process. And, um, its meaning does not become apparent until you have reached a certain point in your awakening journey. And so if you are tuned into the frequency of this message, there's a, a specific reason why that is. Um, as Neville Goddard said, the Bible is the greatest psychology textbook ever written. And I know I've found in my, my own journey that that is absolutely true. And so as you start decoding some of these stories in scripture, it's actually very interesting um, because, you know, for me, these are a lot of stories or ideas that I was familiar with, um, just from reading the Bible throughout my life. But when you get to this point in, in the journey, it takes on, I mean, everything just takes on a completely new meaning. So, um, so anyway, uh, the, the story of the 12 disciples, directly correlates with what takes place in the brain. So um, I'm going to look at the brain as, as more of a literal, um, tangible idea. Um, but also, of course, we know that, you know, every, there is no physical matter as such. Um, so we can also look at everything from a, a completely metaphorical standpoint as well. So if you look at this diagram, you'll see um, the 12 cranial nerves. And you can see a, a couple of things from this. Number one, you'll notice that all of these nerves come in pairs. So they are directly um, it, the, you know, the, the nerve on one side of the brain is directly uh, associated with the, its counterpart on the other side of the brain. So that's a very um, interesting, you know, observation in and of itself. Then you can also see that this, um, in the diagram here, this essentially forms a, a circle and, or, you know, an oval, whatever. <laughs> um, and so you, you can look at how <clears throat> this um, process as these 12 cranial nerves are um, fused within the brain and activated to their full potential, um, you can see that that would create a, a circle essentially um, around the brain. And once that happens, there is a, a, a splitting that takes place. Um, not a splitting, that, that may not be the best word. Um, but essentially there's a, um, I guess really um, the opposite of that, <laughs> of what I said. It, it's a fusion. And so if you, 
if you look at it um, like the power button that we're all familiar with, um, basically there's a line that goes through the the center. And I don't know a better way to put that. I wish I did, but um, it, it that's sort of a, um, a symbol that is representative of what takes place in the brain. And it's very interesting because you can actually feel this and it's not just one event. It's not just one time. It's a process. And so it, um, it takes place over, you know, a period of time and you can feel these, um, areas of the brain being fused together and activated. And then, um, you know, the, it, they're all seated around the table, you, you could say. And then in the center, that is the, the pineal, that is the, the father, basically. So, um, we see this, um, directly referenced in scripture. Revelation 4 4 says, surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. And so, you know, we're thinking, where do you get 24? Well, remember, everything in the brain is, or excuse me, all of these um, cranial nerves in the brain are in pairs. Okay, so that's where this, this comes from. So once we are able to, um, or not able, but it's not, it doesn't come through effort. It just unfolds automatically for every person in humanity will experience this. Every, every individual soul, um, it just may not be in this incarnation. So, um, Upon raising these aspects of mind to what we might call the level of discipleship, which is the ability, again, it's the, you know, the full fusion and activation so that you can then go out into the world and tell this information, tell others. Um, once this process begins taking place, um, you feel you truly feel called to share this information with other people. It doesn't matter. Um, I know for me personally, it does not matter whether one person is listening to this and gets this information or a thousand. Um, I know that the information will find who it needs to find when that person needs to, to find it. So, um, so referencing scripture again, um, once we have brought all of these aspects of mind, so all of these cranial nerves into discipleship, so that's full knowing um, of universal law, we will say, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. I have glorified thee on earth. And now, O oh Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. And so um, I've written about this extensively. I've not talked a lot about this in my videos as of yet. Um, but um, if you're interested in, in knowing more about what this means, um, in the full process, um, definitely check out my writing on, um, <clears throat> on Patreon. And then I, I post quite a bit on Facebook as well. Um, and my Instagram page at, at times. So, um, to put it very succinctly, um, again, this is a process that Every individual consciousness will undergo at some point in time. Uh, we all came here, you know, as individual fragments of source um, to have that experience of becoming individualized and to experience what it felt like to be limited or to be under the confines of time and what appears to be death. There is absolutely no death 
you know, consciousness cannot be destroyed. It's only transferred or transmuted. So, um, that is the work. And once we have had those experiences, we are then compelled to, to tell others and to, we're, we're sent is how the Bible refers to it. So, um, we're, we're compelled to, um, bring into wholeness our own individual universe. And, um, once we come upon this information and this process unfolds, um, we just have this intuitive knowing that this is, um, it's the last incarnation in the phys, it on this plane of existence in the physical body being, um, tied to or burdened with the cross, which is the physical body. So, um, that's what that means when, um, you know, we talk about being, um, or when in John we read, um, being glorified with the glory that I had before the world was. So returning to God, but, um, and I think this is a, a thing that many people, um, sort of are muddled about. And I know I was as well for a while upon returning to source consciousness, we still retain our individuality. So it's all just this, um, sort of fluctuating spiral. It's in and out. It's not, um, you know, we tend to look at like the 3D and the 5D as very like, you know, kind of, kind of black and white. You know, we think, okay, once we get to 5D, we're done with that. Um, what I'm describing here is well beyond, you know, what we might call the fifth dimension of consciousness. Um, but essentially I, I say all that to say that um, within the course of, of a day, you can, you know, go in and out of, of all of these dimensions of, of consciousness, essentially from source consciousness to 3d and back again. So, um, that is part of what we mean when we talk about, um, being burdened with the cross, the physical body, um, particularly upon coming, um, into this information. So let me go over the 12 disciples and really and truly, um, mastering these skills or, uh, mastering these ideas, bringing these disciples into discipleship after purifying them, after redeeming them, um, it is the gateway to unconditional love. Unconditional love um, means rising from a oneness perspective, rising above conditions as they appear. So rising above what we perceive with our five senses and still holding love for ourselves for other other people in our reality because we are one in the same and um, truly you will come upon many tests in this regard um, and it's no there's no outside source that has per, you know quote unquote prepared these tests for you this is something that you as an individual um, fragment of source as individuated consciousness. This is something that you yourself have prepared. You wrote the blueprint. Um, so there's, you know, there's no one outside pulling the strings, basically. It's all us. So the first attribute is called, that's the disciple Simon, and it's the, um, the attribute of righteous hearing. And when we say righteous, what that actually means in the Bible is right consciousness. So it's consciousness that is, um, intentional, um, intentionally directed, 
uh, fused with the the subconscious, operating as one. And so, um, with this, it's the with Simon, it's the ability to hear only the things that render other people in a state of righteousness and render yourself in a state of righteousness. So it's it's going beyond what one hears audibly, the words that someone says, to perceive their intent behind the words and to understand that words are and, and hearing, you know, that is fallible and it is um, certainly not the be all end all. And I went through and I researched all of these names because names are very important, um, just in your personal reality as well as the Bible. Um, I could not correlate all of these to um, the nerve that it um, that it correlates with, but I did with some of them. And so Simon um, specifically means he has heard, and so we can see how that directly relates back to the um, the hearing, the, the nerve, the cranial nerve that is responsible for hearing. So then we have Andrew, and this disciple is, um, it's the ability to hold out faith. And when we talk about faith, really, from my perspective, what we mean is um, intentionally directed awareness. And so it's directing that awareness of self, your, your self-awareness away from anything that is undesired and onto anything that is desired or the things that are desired. And so, um, there again, and we talk about this with really all the disciples, but it's rising above what the five senses tell you. It's rising above that data to intuitively um, form your own conclusions. Then we have James, and that is, um, it's, it's the ability to use judgment in a righteous way. And so again, that we can see how that um, relates back to Andrew as well. It's, um, you know, using our judgment in order to redeem others, redeem ourselves, again, irrespective of any appearance of being. Then we have John, um, which means um, beloved, and that is one that um, that is an attribute that ensures that everyone in your reality becomes the beloved. And so you dream dreams, you revise um, reality to serve in love other people. And um, it, it's by the use of the imagination. Neville Goddard gives an example many times in his writing and his lectures. Um, that's a simple example, but it works. So it's, um, say you encounter someone who is unemployed and they're, they're struggling financially and they tell you about this. In your mind, you go away from this person, you know, you, you part, part ways. Um, and in your mind, using your imagination, you have a choice, obviously, as to how to view that person. You can view them as this, you know, jobless bum <laughs> or whatever, or, you know, you can pity them and think, oh goodness, that, you know, he, he has no job, he's struggling, it's so sad. Um, or you can consciously use your imagination in order to um, revise his state of being and make him employed, as Neville says. So you can rewrite him in, in a situation in which he um, is gainfully employed and he's happy. One 
very easy way that I've found at least to do this is to imagine this person, say it's the same guy that you encountered and you know he was telling you about his troubles. Imagine that he calls you and he says, hey, remember the other day I was telling you about how I was jobless and you know had no prospects and I was struggling. Well, guess what? I got a job. And now, you know, I, 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 it's great pay, everything is fine, everything is, you know, wonderful. And beyond simply imagining that, try to truly feel it in your heart. And so this is the disciple, John. This is, you know, dreaming dreams, not only for yourself. And when I say dreaming dreams, I mean using the imagination, not only to benefit self in love, but also to benefit uh, benefit others in love, to make that person better. Um, so that's John. Philip is a recognition of the Father. This is the, the fusion of God and man. And so this is the knowledge of how to make the word into into flesh. So it's, um, it sort of builds upon the, the use of the imagination, um, in order to make that a reality. So it's, it's this, um, it's essentially the knowledge of using your imagination plus faith, which is directed consciousness in order to create your own reality in an intentional way. So next is Bartholomew, and that is the intentional, uh, or excuse me, it is the imaginative faculty that has been awakened. So it's the, um, the subconscious, the imagination, and it's bringing that, um, it's, it's really honing that ability to imagine with love. And this is what we might call the separation of the wheat from the, the chaff, basically. Um, so we, we have to get to a point where we are able to master the subconscious and, and we're directly working between the conscious mind and the subconscious and the subconscious mind to impress the subconscious with only those things that are um, in love and then to direct it in, in that same way. So, um, then we have Thomas and that is the, the doubter, um, you know, a doubting Thomas, of course, is the, um, the saying, and that is the ability to take any information in your reality, any thought, word, or deed that is not in, in harmony. It's not in concert with what you believe to be the highest good. And you actively choose to doubt that information or to dismiss that information. And you do this not in a way that is, um, repressing those thoughts or suppressing anything. It is at this point, it's not a battle. It's not a struggle. You do this from a place of complete indifference. So that is a, a state of detachment. And so, you know, this might manifest as in your reality, as you know, someone who appears to be trying to deceive you. Um, in some way. If we looked at all the data that the five senses give us, you know, any, most people, 90% of humanity would say, okay, this person is trying to deceive you based on that data. However, Thomas comes in and directly dismisses that idea because it is not in concert with the highest good with right, it is not in the spirit of, of right consciousness. So it's the ability to do that on a, um, in a conscious way. Matthew is the gift of God. And this one is understanding that, um, 
every desire that you have once you have begun to master the mind is a it's a it's a gift there's nothing that is that you would desire at this point um, that would be out of alignment with what God wants in a um, it's it comes from a place of purified um, consciousness essentially and so you you lean into that desire and understand and, and you come to an um, a state of being where you assume that it's already done in order to make it a reality. Um, it's, it's faith, having faith in the plan and in its divine unfolding. So, um, I guess an easy way to say it would be, it's just, it's aligning with your desires in an understanding that all desire that you have at this point is divine. Um, James, the son of Alpheus, is clear seeing. So we might, um, it's, it's vision that perceives things that are not perceivable to the eye of man. And so um, this, you know, really is um, the ability to see only the good, whether that be in a, um, a metaphorical sense or in your tangible, you know, cubic reality, which of course we know those two are interdependent states. Thaddeus is the spoken word. It is the praising of the Lord with gratitude and it's giving thanks for everything that is in, um, in your reality because you understand that um, the spirit of thanksgiving of gratitude feeds abundance and so it is um, it's the control of the tongue and understanding that every word you say every word you hear um, is it's a um, we sometimes say words are spells but that has a bit of a negative connotation um, but words are, you know, prescriptions, I guess you could say, or, you know, they're, they're orders. So everything that comes out of your mouth is, is an order to the subconscious mind to make it come to fruition. So if you are in a continual state of gratitude, even for things that most people would not be grateful for. So if, you know, if you're having a conflict in some way with another person or, or whatever, um, it's that ability to, to say, thank you for what this experience is teaching me, because that does, that does indeed perpetuate, um, this, you know, sense of, of abundance. Then Simon of Canaan is the hearer of good news. And so this is, um, when we say the good news, that's the, the coming into the I am present. It's understanding that you indeed are God. And so anything that, that, um, that you might hear that is out of alignment with that is, you know, I don't want to say pushed aside because that sounds like you're repressing it, but it's just, um, it's, it's an inability to hear anything other than the good news, what we would call the good news. And that is that you yourself are the creator. And finally, um, Judas. And so we know that, um, Judas in the Bible, he, you know, ended up committing suicide because of his supposed, um, you know, traitorous activities against, um, against Jesus. However, what this means from a oneness perspective, when we look at it in this way, it's the understanding that you must die to the present state of being before you can actualize the new desired state of being. Um, it is also the denial of any, any external saviors or what might appear to be external because there is no such thing. Um, 
and it is the retraction of attention to any undesired state and the intentional directed focus on the desired state. Really, this is the recognition that all effects that you see in your world come from yourself. And in order to make that alive, you must, in order to make a desirable state alive, you must die to the the present undesirable state. So, um, again, so that's the, you know, the sort of rundown of the, the 12 disciples. Um, and you know, it, uh, these each correlate with these cranial nerves that we looked at in the brain. And as I said, this is both a, a metaphorical process that happens as well as what we could say is a, a tangible process as well. And it ultimately leads to like the power button. It ultimately leads to true power. This is, you know, the 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 coming into power the the i am presence so i hope i articulated that well if there are any questions please feel free to reach out add a comment or um, send me an email so thank you so much for listening